Bueno, nuestra gratitud a Fundación OSDE por estar acá reunidos con uno de los mejores escritores contemporáneos, John Bambriel, que es además una persona de una gran generosidad y una gran simpatía que va a compartir acá con nosotros algunos de, de los secretos que yo pueda sonsacarle. Eh, yo iba más o menos a repetir eh, lo que dijo el presentador. Eh, para mí fue una gran <coughs> revelación leer a John Banville. Tuve la suerte porque trabajaba en la casa que lo publicaba en castellano, que en ese momento era Edaza, de leer. Yo no sé si fue el primer libro que se tradujo, pero eh, Copérnico. Doctor Copernicus es eh, un libro absolutamente extraordinario. Van Vila ha cosechado a lo largo de los años algunas mejores críticas de, la, de los críticos de lengua inglesa, como Martin Amis o George Steiner, que ha dicho que es uno de los escritores más inteligentes del momento. Eh, hay dos, dos este, vías de acceso a Banville. Una es, eh, por supuesto, las novelas firmadas con el nombre John Banville, eh, como eh, Kepler, Copérnico, eh, El Intocable. Y otra es sus eh, novelas firmadas como Benjamin Black, sus novelas policiales. Eh, en, los dos, en los dos aspectos, Banville revela un conocimiento del oficio verdaderamente admirable. Voy a ir directamente entonces a las preguntas. Cuando se publicó Copérnico, yo lo leí como si fuera una novedad muy, muy tarde, en 1990, pero la novela es de 1975. Tuvo efectivamente en, en los países de habla inglesa lo que yo creía que era el éxito inmediato que debía provocar una novela así? I think if I publish the book now uh, would probably have more success than it did then. Um, I, it was a strange thing for me to do and looking back I think it was probably a great mistake. Uh, I had written what I regarded as my Irish novel, a book called Birchwood. Uh, and I thought, what shall I do now? And I thought I'd become a European novelist of ideas. And I was reading too much uh, of Thomas Mann and writers like that. Uh, you can't have a novel of ideas. I thought I could do it. I tried it in Copernicus. I tried it in Kepler, and then I realized that this is a wrong direction. But wrong directions are always interesting. Uh, it's foolish to look back and think, I should have done otherwise. One does what one does. But no, to answer your question, it did not have the success that it should have had. Oh, that's very simple. Um, I won the Booker Prize in 2005 with The Sea. Great many people think that The Sea was my first book uh, because it had such a huge success because of this prize. I mean, writers like to sneer at prizes and say, oh, they don't matter. And they don't artistically, but Commercially, believe me, they do. Uh, the sea would have sold, I suppose, maybe 8,000 copies in hardback, maybe 20,000 in paperback. After that prize, I think it sold somewhere between quarter and half a million copies. I imagine most people buying the book and saying, this is a Booker Prize book, and reading three pages, and think, I don't want this done. <laughs> But at least they bought it. Um, and there is a serious point to me. I, mean, I think that there is a small, there's a small group of readers, real readers. There's a nice story Borges used to tell. He said, 
when I started writing, I had seven readers because I would give my short stories to my friends. And then I published in a small magazine, so I had 70 readers. And then I published a book and I had 700 readers. He said, now I'm world famous. I have 700,000 readers. Who are these people? Uh, and to a certain extent, I, I do understand what he was talking about. But at the same time, I have to say, that it's wonderful that uh, a prize will disseminate a book, will bring a book to the attention of people who would never have dreamt of buying the book, much less reading it. So that was my first, my first and only success. <laughs> Algunos. Oh, no, 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 no. Writers don't read <laughs> other writers. That's the last thing we do. People think that, uh, you know, there must be these wonderful salons, these soirees where writers are discussing their art and the great issues of the day. All writers ever talk about is money and how terrible their publishers are. Uh, nothing more boring than being in the company of writers. <laughs> Copérnico, que es realmente una novela donde se discuten y se proyectan montones de ideas, ¿pertenece a la tradición, dirías, de la novela histórica, en el sentido en que la escribía Robert Graves o, o Marguerite Yusenard? ¿O es una novela en el sentido en que no debe apelar a ningún adjetivo para ser calificada? Es una novela novela. I started out being, of course, an Irish novelist. And then I wrote a couple of historical novels, uh, Dr. Copernicus and Kepler, in the attempt to be a European novelist of ideas. Uh, in those days, there was a little paperback series called Fontana Modern Masters. And it would be people like George Steiner and Heidegger. And, uh, and I could see way in the future, uh, a volume with, you know, somebody writing on Banville. I was going to be the great European novelist of ideas. This was a foolish ambition. I think I wasted many years uh, writing these books, but we do what we do. We take the directions that we take, and everything somehow feeds into to the process. I was trying to learn to be an artist. I didn't know what being an artist entailed. When I had written those so-called historical novels, I then wrote a novel called Mephisto, which gave me a nervous breakdown. Uh, at least so my wife says. I didn't notice it going past, but then a writer's life, for the most part, is a slow nervous breakdown. Uh, but that, I think, Mephisto was my first real book. Mm -hmm. hace, unos, hace unos días vi en, en internet donde uno puede ver eh, todos nuestros honores y todas nuestras honras y todas, no, todas nuestras vergüenzas, un reportaje compartido con Will Self donde hablabas de la influencia de Dublineses, Dubliners, el primer libro, creo, de, de Joyce, eh, que Joyce dijo que había escrito en un estilo de escrupulosa mezquindad, scrupulous meanness, en el sentido en que difiere mucho de la obra posterior de Joyce y que es complejo de una manera muy rara, en el sentido en que es un libro realista. ¿En qué medida influyó ese primer libro de Joyce en tu obra? o en, en alguna de tus obras. Well, Dubliners was immensely influential because I was a small town boy, lower middle class boy. I knew very little about the world. Uh, I read Wild West stories, I read school stories, I read Agatha Christie. And suddenly at the age of 12 or 13, I was given Dubliners, and I discovered that literature could be about life, life as I knew it. 
uh, in all its meanness and in all its colorfulness and in, in all its glory. This is a great revelation to me. And I immediately uh, began to write dreadfully bad imitations of Joyce's Dubliners. And I guess I was 12, 13, 14. And I have been practicing ever since to learn how to write. Uh, I Recently, I listened to Dubliners again on audio tapes, uh, read by a wonderful Irish actor, Jim Norton. And I realized just how good those stories are. To have produced a book like that in, his, in one's early 20s is almost a miracle. So, and, you know, there's a nice anecdote of late in Joyce's life, an old friend of his coming to visit him from Dublin. Not a particularly uh, literary person, but he said to him, you know, Jim, I think, I really think Dubliners is your best book. And Joyce looked about and said, you know what? I think I agree with you. And I do think it is, certainly in terms of achieved aesthetic purpose, then Dubliners is probably his most nearly perfect book. But it was hugely influential on me, yes. ¿Y qué otros escritores dirías que te influyeron cuando uno es más maleable, cuando uno es joven? Look, the trouble is that every writer thinks that he is completely original that, you know, he sprang from his own head, fully armed. Uh, who wants to admit to influence? Nobody ever seems to notice that the real influences on me would be Henry James and W.B. Yeats. Uh, they say, oh, he's influenced by the book call for Beckett or Joyce, whatever. But the real, the real exemplars for me were Henry James and Yeats, for the reasons that Henry James, I think, invented reinvented the novel as an aesthetic form, as an art form. And Yeats, Yeats's example of not to be afraid of rhetoric, not to be afraid of striking an heroic pose, not to be afraid of saying, I'm an artist and I say it without apology. Art in our time, and even in Yeats's time, had become a sort of word like sex for the Victorians. It was something to be, you know, that people were embarrassed by. I still claim to be an artist. I still claim that art is one of the most vital things that we can do or attempt to do. So Henry James and Yeats were my, my real uh, exemplars. Y en ese, en ese sentido, en una, en una prosa narrativa tan económica y tan perfecta como la que vos escribís, ¿cómo dirías que te influyó la poesía? En, en Kepler creo hay algunas referencias raras y, y anacrónicas a Wallace Stevens y ahora nombraste a Yeats, que, que fue una, o que es una gran influencia y que es una, una, una gran influencia para la poesía en, en, en cualquier lugar del mundo y en particular en Irlanda. ¿Incide la poesía en vos, ¿escribiste alguna vez poesía? Son dos preguntas. Oh, well, yes, of course, I wrote poetry when I was a teenager. My girlfriends, I hope they all destroyed the <laughs> poems that I wrote. Um, well, let me say I wrote verse. I think you have this distinction in Spanish. My old friend John McGahern, a wonderful Irish novelist, He used to make a nice distinction. He said that there is verse, and there's prose, and then there's poetry. And poetry can happen in either. And since he was a novelist, he said <laughs> it happens more often in prose than it does in verse. There are great long reaches of verse that have no poetry in them at all. There are lines of prose that are pure poetry. Um, so in that sense, I like to think of myself as a poet, not moons and dunes and nightingales and all that, you know, poetry. But poetry to me is when prose or verse rises to a level of intensity 
that it cannot be ignored, that you either put it away or you keep reading. W. H. Auden made the point that the poem is the only art form that you take or leave. You can look at a picture and think about what you're going to have for your dinner. You can listen to a symphony and think about that nice girl walking past. But a poem you read or you don't read. I have tried all my life to write prose that has that same level of, of intensity and of demand, and it is demanding. And it is amazing how many readers have declined to, uh, to go with the demand. Uh, that was a joke, by the way. Oh boy, a limp joke, obviously. <laughs> Eh, acerca de lo que John decía recién de, eh, de escribir con un, con, un altísimo, con un altísimo nivel de intensidad. Quien se asome, por ejemplo, al primer párrafo de una novela de John llamada The, The Infinities, una novela del año creo que 2008, ya la primera, la oración inaugural de la novela es altísima poesía, por varios motivos, por la elección del léxico, por la eh, tranquilidad con que discurre y cuenta ya desde la altura lírica una historia y por la modestia con la que se retrotrae. Si tuvieras que elegir entre tus libros, uno va Leí en algún momento que, te, que los leías con cierta vergüenza, los libros del pasado. Eh, pero ¿de cuál te enorgulleces en particular? ¿De ¿Cuál es el que más, cuando, le, cuando lo relees, cuál es el que más te gusta? El que lees con mayor fruición. The next one. <laughs> ¿Y lo lees por anticipado? That's the one that's going to get it absolutely right. Uh, we try for perfection. We strive to get the thing right. We fail. We have to because we can't have perfection. The only thing that matters in art is the quality of the failure. Uh, as by now that quote from Beckett has become a cliche, fail again, fail better. That's all we can do. Uh, I hate all my books. There is... Still can't hear me? <laughs> I, I, my books are an embarrassment to me, as they should be. I, I'm not saying that they're not good books. <laughs> A friend of mine says I mustn't say this kind of thing in public because people fail to spot the irony. But I always say my books are better than everybody else's, they're just not good enough for me. There is a joke there as well. <laughs> Not much of a joke, but still. Uh, I, I do my best to make them as nearly perfect as I can, and I fail. If I didn't fail, I would stop writing. If I succeeded once, I wouldn't keep on. So uh, I, I mean it when I say if I were to choose the best of my books, it would always be the next one. Cuando eh, eh, se publicó eh, El Intocable, que es una novela que eh, toma un sujeto que poco tiene que ver con los de las novelas como Kepler o, o, o Copérnico, que es Anthony Blunt, que era un, un espía, eh, uno como lector queda asombrado de la versatilidad y de la capacidad de John como novelista para atacar los temas. ¿Qué fue lo que te encantó de, de la personalidad de Blunt para escribir El Intocable? Well, uh, Anthony Blunt was, a, as you say, one of the Cambridge spies. He was a, a great uh, art historian, rather dry in his writing, but great great scholar. Um, he was also, uh, 
in those days you had to be secret homosexual because it was illegal. And he was a Russian spy and I felt a great affinity with him. Not that I've ever been a Russian spy or a homosexual or, uh, or a great scholar, but I saw the point of him that he was, like all of us, uh, living a lie as successfully as he could. We all pretend to be ourselves. We, as Diderot says, you know, we, we, we construct a statue of ourselves within ourselves and we try to live up to that image. Uh, in fact, we're all cowering inside ourselves, terrified of the world, terrified of, there's this wonderful girl, uh, Samuel Butler in his diaries. <laughs> he said, each evening, I fall to my knees and say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me one, to get through one more day without being found out. Uh, and I think this is true of all of us. We have to pretend to be who, who we imagine ourselves to be. And the spy and the, the hidden homosexual, these, this seem to be the ideal uh, the ideal character for me to write about, very much like the novelist, uh, watching, reporting, betraying. Mm. <laughs> um, hay una cuestión que tenemos que afrontar más o menos rápidamente, porque si no estaríamos toda la noche hablando, que es la cuestión de cuando hiciste esa transición de los libros firmados por John Banville a los libros firmados por Benjamin Black. Creo que eso ocurrió después de The Sea, pero no sé exactamente. No, 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 no. I... Everybody thinks that, that I invented Benjamin Black after I won the Booker Prize in The Sea. In fact, I had finished the first Benjamin Black book before the shortlist for the Booker came out. This was a, an adventure I embarked on. Uh, I was going to be turning 60. I thought I'd better do something new. I also thought I'm poverty stricken, so I better try to do something that will make me some money. Uh, I'm still waiting for Benjamin Black to make my fortune for me. He's, he's very slow about it, I can tell you. Uh, it, it was a childish uh, adventure. I thought I would write one book like this. And then, you know, I, I kept on doing it because I could do it. Um, and I, uh, I hate the summer. It's the most boring season of all. So I passed the summer by writing a Benjamin Black book. Benjamin Black is a craftsman. Uh, he does his best to make honestly crafted pieces of fiction. Uh, poor old Banbo uh, tries to be an artist, and of course, who knows what that means. So Banbo progresses in confusion and terror and darkness, and Black is up there just writing away very quickly and with great facility, and I hate him, the swine. <laughs> en, entre los eh, novelistas que desarrollaron esa artesanía magistral, creo que están Chandler y, muy de tu gusto, Simenón. Pero Simenón no el de, la, el de las novelas del, del inspector Megret, sino el de las novelas más duras, las novelas... Oh yes, I think, I think, I mean, I just, in fact, it was my reading of Simenon that prompted me to invent Benjamin Black. Uh, I had never read Simenon before. I started reading him 10 years ago. A friend of mine, an English philosopher, recommended him to me and said, you really should, you really should read Simenon. The Maigret books, the first two thirds of each one are really very good, and then the rest of it where he has to do the plot. Uh, is boring, but his his roman dur, his his hard novels, are I think superb, and I firmly believe they are among the best literature of the 20th century. He wasn't given his due, 
because he wrote quickly, because he wrote small books. But no one, I think, had the courage to tell the truth, the ordinary, unadorned, grimy truth in the way that Simenon did. Uh, and, you know, a lot of... <sighs> I, I've never been a snob in terms of uh, literature. I don't, you know, I, I don't even like the word literature. There's just good writing or there's not good writing. And I remember back in the 70s, when my wife and I bought our first dishwasher, the, the instruction manual for the dishwasher was written in beautiful, beautiful English. It really was. Beautiful, clear, clean, straightforward, lovely English. I remember reading it, and reading it again just for the pleasure of reading it. So the point I'm making is that good writing can happen anywhere. Uh, it doesn't have to be high literature. Uh, just, you know, I, I recently discovered, last year I discovered an English historian called Hugh Trevor Roper, whom I'd never read before. Superb stylist, just superb. You know, you have almost an erotic uh, uh, thrill as you read his sentences. And I have no doubt that tomorrow, or next week, or next month, I will discover somebody else. This is the wonderful thing about books and about reading. There's always somebody out there waiting that you have not read. There's always a new treasure waiting for you. Uh, you know, we must never, this is my, this is my, my sermon, you must never lose sight of the value of the written word and the written word written well. Uh, I always say that the greatest invention of humankind is the sentence. We, there have been civilizations that didn't have the wheel, but they had the sentence. That's why they were a civilization. Uh, and we must hold on to that. We, it's because we speak in what we think are sentences. In fact, they're just broken fragments. But the sentence when it's written down is the most beautiful thing that we have achieved because it contains everything that we are. We express ourselves. We, our laws are written in, in, in sentences. Um, you know, I, I'm getting to be an old bore now going on about the sentence, but I think it's worth reiterating again and again, and that we must, above all, nowadays, we must teach our children to be able to write and speak in sentences. Sorry, that's the end of my sermon. Eh, una de las distinciones que, que creo que no es solo mi atrevimiento, el que vos estableciste entre los escritores, porque uno de los escritores que con, el, con con el que te compararon, es Nabokov, el escritor ruso que escribía en inglés. Pero vos dijiste una cosa muy seria y muy, muy eh, precisa sobre Nabokov, que es que era duro de oído, que no tiene buen sentido del ritmo, sobre todo en inglés. Eso, y que es un escritor de imágenes, un escritor más visual que auditivo. Si eh, vos tuvieras que optar entre los escritores de oído y los escritores de imagen, ¿dónde te pondrías? I mean, Irish literature has always been very close to song. Um, rhythm to us is very important indeed. Nabokov not only was tone deaf, he couldn't hear music. Uh, but he was writing in a language that was not his, his mother tongue. He was a master of English, but he couldn't sing in English. Um, and this may be a disadvantage, you know. Uh, it might be better that one should write clear speaking, spoken language than singing language. But it's our weakness as Irish writers to, the melody is, is often the melody comes first. Sometimes I write a sentence and the melody in it is beautiful. And then I look at it and realize the sentence has no meaning whatsoever. 
that I've been carried away by the music. So there's a great danger in that. But uh, I still would want to hear rhythm. But you know, the great American poet Elizabeth Bishop, she said that her favorite line of poetry was that blues song, uh, I think it's in St. Louis, I hate to see that evening sun go down. And it is an absolutely beautiful uh, line of iambic pentameter. Again, it's not pretending to be great literature, but it, I hate to see that evening sun go down. Uh, you know, you, you, you have to sing with it. You have, that's my kind of writing anyway. Many people would say that that's my, <laughs> my great failing. Acá llega una pregunta interesante porque es cierto que se ha perdido un poco eh, algo que uno sabía cuando era más joven que es lo que significaba una novela de ideas. Una novela de ideas se consideraban las novelas de los grandes escritores europeos como Thomas Mann. Por eso preguntan acá, ¿qué significa novela de ideas? ¿O qué significa para vos una novela de ideas? I suppose the great crisis of civilization that, we've, that we faced, I mean, civilization has faced many crises. It's in constant crisis, I suppose. But the one that we uh, had to deal with, I was born in 1945, after the end of the most cataclysmic uh, war of self-destruction that there had been, waged by a country which had produced some of the greatest literature, uh, I still think German literature is superb, but the people who produced that produced a, a terrible war, not all on their own. So we had to, to, to deal with that, and I suppose writers felt that they, that, that since they had a voice, they had to think in print. I remember talking to Günter Grass, who died recently. And Grass was saying how it was his great privilege, uh, and great privilege of writers of his generation after the war, to take back the German language from the Nazis. Um, Grass uh, very wisely didn't do it in terms of ideas. He did it in terms of imagery and of magic realism. Uh, But Thomas Mann, uh, Hermann Broch, people like that, they felt that they, they had to find a way of, they had to find an accommodation within fiction for ideas. I don't think it's possible. Uh, ideas should be kept to philosophy, uh, to social writing, and the novel should be kept for poetry. But in those days, I was young and foolish, and I didn't know what I was doing. Not that I'm, now I'm old and foolish, and I still don't know what I'm doing. Preguntan también si no consideras um, el intocable y el mar pueden ser consideradas como novelas de, de ideas. No, no. No, no, they're, they're, I hope, uh, pure works of art. Uh, the Untouchable and the Sea are very different kinds of books. The Untouchable, of course, is based in, on historical figures and in a historical time. But it's still, it's, it makes fiction of history. Uh, art is a very strange cannibalistic form. It consumes its material. Uh, I remember <laughs> my wife and I were together first and we were driving somewhere and having one of those truly terrible arguments that people, couples have when they're trying to adjust to each other. And my wife was in full rhetorical flight telling me what a swine I was, quite rightly. Uh, and it was so passionate and so beautifully expressed, I said to her, can I use that? <laughs> and she said, she stopped and she said, 
you're even more of a monster than I thought you were. And I said, yes, yes, I know, but can I use it? And being a writer's wife, she said, oh, all right, I suppose you can. So we, we devour, we devour the people around us. Um, we're, we're not really human beings, um, not in the full sense, because we're always at one remove from ordinary life. Terrible thing to confess, but that's the way it is. Hay una pregunta acerca de un escritor que yo sé que te interesa, si bien este, te interesa sobre todo como estilista, que es Hugh Trevor Roper, el historiador. Eh, y te preguntan si sabías que había escrito la biografía de Ken Philby y que además que había hecho la investigación de la muerte de Hitler de la que, hoy se, cumplen, de la que se cumplen 70 años. Oh, yes, I mean, uh, if you don't know Hugh Trevor Roper's writing, and I don't know how it translates into Spanish, but it is some of the best English prose of the 20th century, indeed of any century. Uh, he makes a kind of poetry out of... Mm -hmm. First of all, he was a superb scholar, he knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, but he was able to talk about it with such musicality and such vividness and such humor um, that, you know, he's one of the, I mean, I, you know, I would give 10 bad novels for two pages of Hugh Trevor Roper. Uh, novelists are so uh, arrogant and so uh, full of their self-importance. But as I say, the guy who wrote the Uh, instruction manual for the washing machine uh, was in his work, di sorry, dishwasher, my God, you have a very sharp audience. <laughs> uh, dishwasher uh, was in his way, uh, I don't know what the word is, artist is not right, I suppose. I've, I often think that I value craftsmanship over uh, artistic ability. The world is full of would-be artists. Uh, we could do with much more craftspeople. Podríamos hacer una novela de ideas con la cantidad de preguntas que provocas en la gente, que quiere saber muchísimas cosas de vos. Alguien quiere saber eh, cómo te sentiste escribiendo en primera persona como un asesino en el libro de las pruebas. Oh, well, I mean, this is what we do. The imagination makes art. Um, I remember when I wrote the book of evidence about a murderer and a, a woman who worked in the prison service came to me and she said, well, you must have been in jail. And I said, no, I've never been in jail. I've never been a murderer. I've never been a woman. Uh, <laughs> but I, I write about these things because this is what the imagination, the imagination makes art, the imagination also makes life. I'm convinced of this. We only live in ourselves and we only live with the reality of others by imagining ourselves and others into existence. It's when the imagination fails in the middle of the last century or in Rwanda or in Bosnia or wherever, that's when we're, we can slaughter each other without compunction. Because if you imagine the person in front of you into existence as a real human being, you, you, you won't be able to do it. No, I'm straying into ridiculous, ridiculously deep waters here. But I say again that the imagination makes life and makes art. It's the greatest gift that we have. Um, it's, I, You know, I absolutely love dogs, and I look at my dog, and I think I envy him for the most part because he lives for the moment, he lives in the moment. And he is an absolutely real creature because of his mere existence. But he's not conscious of death, and it's the consciousness of death that gives us the gift of imagination. It's a terrible burden. I would rather not know that I'm going to die 
but I wouldn't be without the gift of imagination. I think the two are very closely allied. I think that we, as I say, I think we get imagination from the consciousness of death. And that is what allows us to, to love and to hate. Uh, that vivid sense of being in the world and of there being other people in the world with us. I'm sure we can all remember that moment when we were three, four, five years of age and we suddenly realized there are other people. You know, before there was just me and my mother and now suddenly there are all these other people. That's when imagination starts. And in some people that's where imagination fails and they turn out to be sad or dangerous creatures. Anyway, I'm, I'm in the pulpit again giving another sermon, so I'll stop. Alguien quiere que digas algo acerca de la estructura de ghosts. Well, it's unfair to speak about a particular book because the majority of you won't have read that particular book. I like the complexity of structure. I like making books. I like, I'm always very proud of my time structures, for instance. Most people reading my books don't realize the complexity of the time sequences in them. Um, these are the, <laughs> these are the ways one gets through one days, one's days by t playing with technique, uh, playing with the complexity of the form. Because the, the novel form, like the form of the sonnet or the symphony, uh, is an immensely complex form. We imagine that it's simpler than it is because it's written in the stuff that we use every day of our lives to speak. We, we think because we can speak, therefore we know uh, how a novel is made because it seems to be made in the same, from the same material. It's not, of course, written language, literary language. It's entirely different from the stuff that we speak in every day. But I like that, I like the dealing with the complexity of it. But as I say, it would be unfair to talk about any particular book, since most of you have read it. And anyway, I've forgotten it. <laughs> it's this wonderful thing. A friend of mine <laughs> told me that when Beckett was in the nursing home in, in Paris at the end of his life, he went to visit him. And Beckett said, you know, I've come to an age where I've, I've forgotten so much and I keep forgetting so much. And my friend began to sympathize and commiserate. Beck said, no, 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 it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I've forgotten so much, you know. The problem is that one only forgets the good things. One never forgets one's sins. Eh, uno de los que pregunta, quiere saber dónde se origina tu gusto y tu destreza para las comparaciones. y acerca de tu fascinación por los olores. Well, to answer the second part, I mean, I can't understand why writers don't write about uh, smells. I mean, it's one of the most, one of the strongest senses that we have. Uh, one walks through one's life being assailed by smells, good or bad or, you know, of no consequence, but we are constantly assailed by it. And uh, so much of our moods, so many of our moods, are dictated by, by, by this, that sense of smell. And uh, <laughs> let's not get too deeply into it, but one only has to think about love and physical passion and what I put, how important the sense of smell is in that. So uh, it seems to be perfectly natural to talk about smell. I think the first part of the question was about metaphor, and uh, I think that that is, I have slightly ambiguous feelings about this. I sometimes feel that one should really just write about the thing itself and not be comparing it to something else. But on the other hand, metaphor and simile enrich the world, uh, and it, well, enrich our conception of the world 
to look at something and, and have this, uh, somebody's wonderful inspiration to see you know, how like something else it is, which is entirely different from it. This is an enriching sense of it. And, and this is what art does. It's not for making us better or making us more moral or doing it. All art can do is enrich the sense of being alive. Uh, this is my opinion. This is what art is for, is to make us feel more vividly alive. Uh, because we get so accustomed to being in the world that we keep forgetting what an extraordinary thing it is to be here. You know, we get 60, 70, 80, well, these days maybe 90 or 100 years on this earth. It's a tiny, tiny moment. And yet it is such an extraordinary phenomenon. I never ever get used to being in the world. Um, I never get used to the sky, for instance. The sky is the most extraordinary thing. We're walking under infinity every moment of our day. Even at night, you look up, you're looking into infinity. And then from the horizon come these great floatings of wreckage as if some enormous battle were going on beyond the horizon. And here's this smoke of battle. Uh, clouds, clouds fascinate me. Um, and that's the least of it. You know, that's just the sky and clouds. Then there's human beings. Um, it is a constant, constant amazement to me. Someone said something to Joyce once about, you know, ordinary people can't, uh, read your work. He said, I've never met an ordinary person. What's an ordinary person? Nor have I. Every human being is completely extraordinary and individual and even the least of us uh, is, is an extraordinary phenomenon. I mean, this is, to me, this is what art does. As I say, it's, it's merely for redirecting our, our attention to how what an extraordinary phenomenon it is to be here on the surface of the earth for the few years it's given to us. And it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And I hope when I'm on my deathbed, I'll be scrabbling to, to have the last little bits of experience. I'll say, open the window. Let me look at the sky. Let me look at the clouds. And, you know, who knows? Uh, a human being might hove into view as well. Sorry, I get carried away when I talk about this because one sits at one's desk just grinding away day after day and one forgets what it is that one is doing. But it is, art like life is an extraordinary adventure. Eh, voy, a, voy a interrumpir un poco el stream of consciousness de la, del público para hacerte una pregunta que tenía pendiente y es que leí en algún reportaje que en algún momento pintaste y que estabas influido raramente por la poesía de Dylan Thomas. Oh, I, I mean, I was, when I was an adolescent, I read Dylan Thomas, as we all did. Um, it was kind of like listening to Bob Dylan. Was sort of this, this stuff that was, this stuff that churned out. Um, we grew up then and learned. Um, learn the error of our ways. I did try to be a painter when I was in my teens. <laughs> I, had, I couldn't draw, I had no sense of color, I had no sense of draftsmanship. These are all distinct disadvantages if you want to be a painter. Uh, <laughs> so I gave up, but it did, trying to be a painter did teach me to look at the world with a painterly eye, I think. To look at colors, to look at shapes, to look at the way the world manifests itself, where the world presents itself to our eye. Uh, and I, I often think that this is another way of looking at art, that it's simply a presentation of, it's a kind of witness of the world. This is what I saw. This is how it looked to me. This is how it smelled to me. This is how it felt to me. Uh, and you know, in a way, I would love to have been a painter. I would love to have been a composer. But I can see that for me, being a writer was the right thing to do because it contains all those things. I can paint, I can, I can write music, um, 
I can even dance in words. Um, I mean, of course, every artist thinks that his or her medium is the, is the only one. But to me, defective as the novel is, and it is a, an untidy, defective form, but it still manages to, it seems to me, to get closest to the sense, as I said a while ago, of what it is to be alive, what it is to be conscious. Uh, and you know, what's the point of being here if we don't constantly examine what it is to be here, what it is to be human? And, dare I say it, to celebrate that strange phenomenon of being alive. Como una pregunta del público que es, ¿cómo fue la experiencia de ponerte en la piel de Chandler para hacer revivir a Philip Marlowe en la primera novela de Benjamin Black? Yeah. Well, that was great fun. Uh, I was asked by the estate of Raymond Chandler to write a Philip Marlowe novel. I'd been reading Chandler since I was a teenager. I loved his style. I loved the way he turned crime fiction into maybe not an art form, but certainly he made something elegant of it, something poised, something wonderfully uh, witty and cynical. Hmm. And uh, I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll try this. And I found that I could do it. Um, and I had a wonderful time, which I don't usually have when I'm writing. Uh, I did it once, I will never do it again. But it was good while it lasted. Si era realmente posible en Irlanda en los 50. No, pero no, no puedo entender cuál era el cuento. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh, I wish it had been. Uh, uh, ancient Light. Uh, it's about uh, a certain level about a love affair between a 15-year-old boy and a 35-year-old woman in the 1950s. I'm told that such things happened. I met somebody who said that every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon he used to go three doors down and sleep with a traveling salesman's wife because he was all, the husband was always away on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and he was about 15. Um, every 15-year-old boy in Ireland should have had uh, a 35-year-old lover, but <laughs> not in my time. What I wanted to write in my portrait of Mrs. Gray in Ancient Light was a portrait of an actual living woman, not a romanticized version, not a, uh, a fantasized version, but an actual human being. Uh, and I love Mrs. Gray. I love her, her dullness and her imperfections and her, her wonderfully generous sensuality. I'm sure it must have happened in the 1950s. Mind you, it didn't happen to me. Te preguntan si sentís que el que el environment, que el, que el, el, sí, de tu infancia fue influyente e instrumental para convertirte en escritor. Oh yes, of course. All all artists feed on on childhood. Baudelaire said that genius, and he meant genius in the, in the small g. Genius consists in an ability to summon up childhood uh, at any moment. I still uh, feed on my childhood because, you know, <clears throat> everything we know, everything we learn, we get in about the first, between the ages of about four, when we realize that our mother or our father is not going to be there forever, chewing us on when we, you know, break wind. Uh, and we have to accept that, as I said earlier, that there are other people in the world. But between then and about the age of 15, we learn everything. Everything after that is just uh, nuance and uh, repetition. But 
A 15-year-old child knows everything that there is to be known about the world. So yes, that, that's, that's my material and that's where I keep going back to. And anyway, look, I think women grow up, it seems to me they do, men certainly don't. Um, I'm still the child that I was. Uh, I'm still the child wondering why on earth my mother couldn't still be here taking care of me. This is the sad tragedy of men's lives. Where has mummy gone? Uh, but that is very productive for, for the making of art. Pregunta muy interesante para el interesado y para todos, tal vez no para vos, que dice, ¿cómo haces para que tus influencias no se conviertan en plagios? Sorry, that I don't play. Uh, I'm not influenced by anybody. I sprang fully formed from my own head. I'm a total uh, individual, totally unique. Um, <laughs> To answer you seriously, uh, influence is always dangerous because one is influenced by the great predecessors. And the greater a writer is, the easier it is to merely to parrot him or her. It's sort of easy to write like Beckett, but you know, it, it would be infinitely bad. One has to try to make one's own voice, and that's the hardest thing to do. Um, and there are always echoes. I mean, sometimes I write a, a fine phrase, and <laughs> I look at it and I think, oh Christ, that's not, that's, that was actually written by Joyce, I better get rid of that. Uh, <laughs> one's head is filled with echoes. Um, but then, as T.S. Eliot wisely said, the inexperienced writer borrows the experienced writer steals. Um, so stealing is, but you know, I wouldn't mind being stolen from. I remember reading a, uh, one of uh, uh, W.T. Zebalt's books, and I found a sentence of mine in the middle of it. And I was very flattered, you know. So he, could, he could have done more, I would have been even more flattered. Hay una pregunta acerca de una respuesta anterior tuya. Eh, que es que te habías convertido en un novelista europeo algo que a lo mejor cuesta trabajo imaginar desde acá de todos los novelistas que escriben en Europa son europeos eh, ¿a qué te referías con convertirte en, en, en un novelista continental en un novelista europeo? Oh, I meant that I would become a writer like the writers who were my heroes, like the, the, the great internationalists like Thomas Mann, Hermann Roch, and so on, mm -hmm. um, instead of being merely a, an Irish writer. There's a, wonderful, there's a wonderful line in Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. It's in the Shem the Penman episode, which is a self-portrait. And he says, I, I apologize to the interpreters for this, blame Joyce, not me. Where he says he became a far sooner right, meaning he would far sooner clash with the hash of Europe's lentils than deal with Ireland's split little pea. And in a way, it's been my motto all my life. Uh, I hate the notion of being a little Irelander, uh, of clinging to one's little island and imagining that it is the navel of the world. Uh, but. Maybe that was a mistake. Maybe I should have written out of what I knew. I mentioned earlier John McGarhan, who probably not terribly well known here, but a wonderful writer. And he, all his material came from his life, from the life that he knew as a child. And I remember having an argument with him one day and saying, you know, it's, it's, it's fine for you because you can use the world that you came from. But I'm not interested in the world that I came from. Uh, it bored me when I was living through it. Um, I grew up in a small town in Ireland, in Wexford. I was so bored of the place. I knew I would be there for such a short time that I never learned the names of the streets. 
uh, and that is a loss. I, I, but the the great writers who wrote so vividly about Ireland got out as quickly as they could and never came back. Joyce, uh, you know, who went on and on about Dublin and his love of the place, he made sure never to come back. Uh, he, what Joyce did was he invented a Dublin of the mind. Uh, but um, I've forgotten what the question was. I'm getting lost. My brain is softening. Una pregunta a partir de una perplejidad o duda de George Steiner en Gramática de la Creación acerca de la pérdida de la posibilidad de crear. ¿Cómo ves, cómo ves John, el futuro de la creación? Oh, my goodness, that was a, that was a simple, straightforward question. Um, Well, it's, it's simply answered, we are creative human beings. We, how could we lose that? Uh, we are endlessly inventive. Uh, I, despite all the, the evidence, I'm sort of optimistic. I think we will save ourselves in some way. The, it's what, I remember when I was going to school, uh, I found it hard to believe when we were taught in religious classes that This, the drive towards self-preservation was stronger than the drive towards re reproduction. Because being a small boy with my gonads very busy, I couldn't believe that anything would be stronger than the drive towards sex. But our, yes, our, our drive to self-preservation will keep us going. And that is fueled by ingenuity and creativity. And I mean, we're infinitely creative creatures. We're horrible creatures, really. You know, we are the <laughs> we're the most successful virus the world has ever known. Uh, but we are successful. Um, we have, to the cost of the world and to our own cost, we have subdued nature. Nature will have its revenge on us. Nature will find a virus that's even stronger than we are. And as in the Middle Ages, will you know, will reduce us by about five eighths uh, and will will renew itself but that'll be good for us i just hope that my grandchildren and their children and their children they don't get the virus this is i mean you know it's not a it is a bleak future but the past was very bleak as well why should we imagine the future will be prettier than the past but we will constantly be inventing 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 amazing Bueno, vamos a pasar las últimas para tu tranquilidad y alivio porque estás bastante cansado, yo sé. Eh, dice, si le pregunta, supongo que debe ser un editor el que pregunta esto, si le das importancia a las tapas de tus libros y si participás en el diseño o en el proceso creativo de las tapas de tus libros y si tenés alguna anécdota relacionada con ese tema. No, 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 I, I, I never, I couldn't uh, interfere in covers and so on. It would be, be too much. Uh, uh, but I love, I mean, and I'm not saying this because I'm in a Spanish-speaking country, I love the covers of my uh, Alfaguara publications. They are so sexy, much sexier than the books. Uh, I think they're, they're, I just got the design the other day for my new book, which is coming out in, uh, I don't know, later in the year. Uh, and again, it's just, a, it, the book is called The Blue Guitar, and the design they've done is just a, a woman lying on her side, fully dressed, you know, no, but mm -hmm. just with her hand on her hip, and she has the shape of a guitar with her hand on her. It is exquisite, absolutely exquisite. And some of my uh, books, my German, the German editions of my books are beautiful in that old-fashioned way. The Germans still publish books as they used to be published in the, in the 30s. Um, some of them are awful. I mean, some of my, well, let's not go into which countries produce the worst ones. Some of them are awful. But, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by what designers will come up with, what ideas they will come up with. Um, so they, you know, I finished by saying, 
writers are constantly complaining about their publishers. Maybe I've been very lucky. I have never had anything but good experience with publishers. Maybe once or twice, a bit of a few slightly bad experiences, but it's particularly editors. Editors have to, I mean, look, an editor gets a book from me, and I, <laughs> I remember talking to somebody about ancient light or the infinities or describing it to my editor before he got it, and his face sank. And he said, oh, right, another crowd pleaser. Yeah. Um, I, I have nothing but sympathy for them uh, getting books like mine. They have to try to sell them, and they have to pretend that they're something other than they're not, and they have to design them with beautiful women on the covers with their hands and their hips. Uh, and, you know, editors are still among the last of the good souls in the world. I do a lot of screen writing nowadays, and believe me, dealing with the world of, let's call it Hollywood, is impossible. Because everybody knows how to write a film script. Everybody, from the producer, the director, down to the person who does the catering on the film set, they all know how to write a script, except the person who wrote the script. Everybody has an opinion on it. Whereas you write a book, you send it in, publisher says, oh God, this is going to be very difficult to sell. But anyway, we'll do our best. And they publish it. It's one of the last of the great, I don't know if you have the term in Spanish, one of the great cottage industries. It's still a small, uh, gentlemanly, gentle, personly industry. So I'm, let it go out that I love my publishers. <laughs> pregunta, eh, creo que inevitablemente la tendría que haber hecho yo, que es, si leíste ar, eh, literatura argentina, y de ser así, ¿qué escritores valorás y por qué? Oh, of course, I mean, we all read Borges. Borges was such a, uh, such a revelation to us in the, in the 60s and 70s. Here was a, a new world, a new way of writing fiction. I love the notion that uh, Borges and his friend uh, Bioy Casares used to uh, mock Ulysses. They thought this was an awful piece of work. Um, you know, it's always, always good to, to hear one's, one's the, the, the heroes of one's time being given a good kick or knocked down. Uh, and I love that. And now, uh, my good friend Rodrigo Fresan, I think is a wonderful writer. Uh, so, Borges to now. Uh, but I would say, and I hate to end on a gloomy note, it is so sad that so little foreign fiction is translated into English. The English speaking world has become so arrogant that, you know, ours is the only literature that counts. So that now we, and of course, people in the English speaking world speak almost no other languages, we just don't know what's going on in world literature. This is an absolute disaster for us. We have no idea what's happening in, in, even in Spanish, even in French, even in Italian, not to mention Chinese or Serbo Croat or whatever. There may be superb work out there, but we don't know because publishers, and publishers have tried. Uh, they really have tried. There was a wonderful English publishing company called Chatter and Windows, which kept translating uh, foreign fiction up to the 90s, but it failed because, as I say, in our arrogance, we just don't think this, we're not interested in what's happening elsewhere. And this is a disaster for us. And it's going to be a disaster for everybody because the English-speaking world, you know, English is such a, a domineering language now. This is a dominating language, domineering as well. This is a disaster for us. So really, what you should all do is encourage and, you know, make your governments fund translation uh, uh, agencies. Make them, make your government translate your literature into English, or into French, into Italian, whatever. I know it's easily said, it's harder <laughs> to do, but uh, keep it in mind. Because, you know, your literature is your language. Mm -hmm. This is the expression of your sensibility uh, in the world. Um, you know, you can send your politicians out, you can send your soldiers out, you can do all that, but you know, the, what your writers write is the expression of your sensibility. Sermon again, I'm sorry, I do apologize. 
Bueno, eh, de nuevo agradecer a la Fundación Ode y agradecerle muchísimo a John su generosidad y su humor para contestarnos. ¿eh? Y gracias a ustedes. Muchas gracias.